This is lesson 23 of our Calculus 2 series, Calculus with Parametric Curves. Suppose we have a curve defined parametrically with x equals f of t, y equals g of t, where f and g are differentiable in t, and y is a differentiable function of x. Since y is a differentiable function of x, we know that we have a smooth curve in the xy plane, and we can talk about the slope of the curve at any point. So how can we compute that slope? How can we compute dy dx when we have x is equal to f of t and y is equal to g of t? Well, remember that we have the chain rule that says for the composition of functions, y is a function of x and x is a function of t, the derivative with respect to t of y is going to be y prime of x of t times x prime of t, or we can write that as dy dt is equal to dy dx multiplied by dx dt. And so if we're looking for the slope of the curve in the xy plane, we're looking for dy dx. So we can solve here for dy dx and we get dy dx is equal to dy dt over dx dt. So this is the slope of the curve in the xy plane at any t value because these are evaluated at any t value. And of course this is provided that dx dt is not zero. And then what would the second derivative look like? Well, the second derivative would be d squared y over dx squared. It's the derivative with respect to x of dy dx. Now remember, dy dx is written in terms of t, and so we're treating it as an original y. So the formula for dy dx looks like this, and we are replacing a dy dx in for this y here and for this y here. So that gives us d squared y over dx squared is equal to the derivative with respect to t of dy dx over dx dt. So let's take a look at an example. If we have x equals radical t and y is equal to e to the t, we want to find dy dx and evaluate at t equals 0 and t equals 1. We also want to find the second derivative d squared y over dx squared and discuss the concavity of the curve. So to find dy dx, we're going to need dx dt and dy dt. This is t to the one-half power, so dx dt is going to be one-half t to the negative one-half power, or one over two radical t. dy dt is going to just be e to the t. So then dy dx is going to be dy dt over dx dt and simplifying gives us 2 radical t e to the t. We're asked to evaluate this at t equals 0. At t equals 0 we have 2 times radical 0 times e to the 0, so that's equal to 0. That's the slope of the curve at t equals 0. And at t equals 1 we have 2 times radical 1 times e to the first, so that's 2e. That's the slope of the curve at t equals 1. And we'll take a look at these two on the graph of the curve in just a couple minutes. But let's take a look at part b and find the second derivative. Remember that for the second derivative we need to find the derivative with respect to t of dy dx over dx dt. So we take our dy dx, which is 2 radical t e to the t, and we want to take its t derivative for our numerator here. And for that, we're going to need the product rule. So we take the derivative of 2 radical t and multiply that by e to the t. That gives us 1 over radical t e to the t. And then we copy the 2 radical t and multiply that by the derivative of e to the t. And so we're here in the numerator. And our denominator is again dx dt, or 1 over 2 radical t. So now we want to simplify and so we're here, 2 e to the t plus 4 t e to the t. Now what can this second derivative tell us about the concavity of the curve? 
Well, notice that because of the definition of this function, we know that t must be greater than or equal to zero. Here we have x equals radical t. That tells us that t must be greater than or equal to zero. So now when we're taking a look at our second derivative, we have 2e to the t plus 4 times t e to the t. Everything here is greater than or equal to zero. In fact, the 2 e to the t is strictly positive, so we have something strictly positive plus something that's greater than or equal to zero, so that's gonna be strictly positive. Another way we can look at that is by factoring the e to the t, and so we have e to the t times 2 plus 4 t. We know that 2 plus 4 t is going to be greater than or equal to two, which is strictly positive, and e to the t is always strictly positive. So this product is definitely going to be strictly positive, and so that tells us that our second derivative is positive and our curve is concave up for all t greater than or equal to zero. Now let's graph this curve by eliminating the parameter. We have x equals radical t, so solving for t we get t is equal to x squared, and y is equal to e to the t, so that's e to the x squared. And notice that x is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. We only have the positive square root here. So we're graphing y equals e to the x squared for x greater than or equal to zero. And this is the same graph we had in lesson 22. And so what we found for slope is that the slope is equal to zero at t equals zero. At t equals one, the slope is equal to 2e, and this graph is always concave up. Let's take a look at another example. x is equal to t squared minus 1, y is equal to sine 2t. We want to sketch the curve for t between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and we want to find the derivative dy dx for t equals negative pi over 2, t equals pi over 2, and t equals 0. Now to sketch, we want to start with a table of data, and notice that t is going from negative pi over two to pi over two, so let's increment in pi over four units. So here are our t values, and x is equal to t squared minus one, so in order to plot, it's good to have an approximation. Pi squared over four is approximately 10 over four, so 10 fourths minus one is around six fourths, which is equal to three halves. Similarly, we have approximately 10 over 16 minus one, so that's negative six over 16, or negative three eighths, and those values are going to help us plot. Our y values are a little bit easier to compute, and so we're here with our x and our y values. And so plotting the points looks like this. We're starting here with approximately 3 halves comma 0, and then we have approximately negative 3 eighths comma negative 1, negative 3 eighths comma negative 1, then negative 1 0, which is here, then negative 3 eighths positive 1, and back to approximately 3 halves comma 0. So our curve looks like this. Now for part b, we're asked to find dy dx, the slope of this curve, for t equals negative pi over 2, pi over 2, and 0. So at t equals negative pi over 2, we're looking for the slope at this point, but it's in this direction as we're getting started with this curve here. Then at t equals 0, we're at the point negative 1, 0, we're looking for this slope here. And then for t equals pi over two, we're looking for this slope. Again, it's at the same point of pi squared over four minus one comma zero, but it's in the other direction because t is now equal to positive pi over two. So let's take a look at those computations. dx dt is equal to two t, and dy dt is two cosine two t. So that gives us dy dx as two cosine two t over two t, or cosine 2t over t. So dy dx at t equals negative pi over 2 is cosine of negative pi over negative pi over 2, so that's negative 1 over negative pi over 2, or 2 over pi. The derivative at t equals pi over 2 
is cosine of pi over pi over 2, so that's negative 1 over pi over 2, or negative 2 over pi. And then at t equals 0, notice we have cosine of 0 over 0. So we have 1 over 0, non-zero over zero gives us infinite behavior. So this is an infinite slope or a vertical tangency. And that's what we expected from looking at the graph. We expected vertical tangency here. And here we have the slope equal to 2 over pi, and in the other direction we have the slope equal to negative 2 over pi. Now let's take a look at another. Find the points on the curve where the tangent line is horizontal or vertical. So what we just saw in the last problem about vertical tangency at t equals zero, that gives us an idea of where to start for this problem. For vertical tangent line, we want our derivative dy dx to be non-zero over zero because we know that gives us infinite behavior. And for a horizontal tangent line, we want our slope dy dx to be equal to zero. So let's compute dy dx. For that we need dx dt and dy dt. Here we have dx dt is equal to cosine t and dy dt is equal to negative 3 sine 3t. Three and so dy dx is negative 3 sine 3t three over cosine t. So for points with horizontal tangency we want to set this derivative equal to zero, which means our numerator is going to equal zero. So negative three sine of three t is equal to zero. We can divide both sides by negative three that says sine of three t is equal to zero. Now we know that the sine function is equal to zero when the angle is zero positive or negative pi, positive or negative two pi, etc. And so that's three t is equal to these values. So solving for t, we divide them all by 3, and we get t is equal to 0, positive or negative pi over 3, positive or negative 2 pi over 3, positive or negative pi. And this is as far as we need to go because remember, we are on the interval t going from negative pi to pi. So now we found all of the values here for which the derivative is equal to 0. And just notice that cosine t is not equal to 0 at any of these values. Because remember, if we want to say our derivative is equal to zero, we need the numerator equal to zero and the denominator not equal to zero. But keep in mind that we were asked for the points on the curve, not the t values. So we need to take these t values and find the corresponding xy pairs. So plugging into x equals sine t, y equals cosine of three t gives us these points here. Now for the points of vertical tangency, we want to take our derivative and get the denominator equal to zero, and we want to make sure that the numerator is then non-zero. So setting cosine t equal to zero over the interval negative pi to pi, that gives us t equals positive or negative pi over two as our only solutions. So again, we notice that the numerator is not zero there, and that's great. And so what are the corresponding points for t equal positive and negative pi over 2? We're here, 1, 0, and negative 1, 0. So taking a look at the graph of this function, we can see all six points of horizontal tangency. And the two points of vertical tangency. Now let's take a look at arc length with parametric curves. If a curve C in the xy plane is described by the parametric equations x equals f of t, y equals g of t, where t goes from alpha to beta, where f prime and g prime are continuous on the closed interval alpha beta, and C is traversed exactly once as t increases from alpha to beta, then the length of C is the integral from alpha to beta of radical dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. And the details here are very similar to that for y equals f of x, what we had in lesson 20. So I won't go into the details here, but you can find that in most textbooks. 
So let's take a look at an example here. x equals e to the t plus e to the negative t, and y equals 5 minus 2t. Let's find the arc length of the curve over the interval t going from 0 to 3. So notice that we're going to need dx dt and dy dt here. So dx dt here is e to the t plus e to the negative t times negative 1, so that's e to the t minus e to the negative t. And dy dt is just negative 2. Alpha is equal to 0 and beta is equal to 3. So let's set up our integral. We're here. And now if there's any hope of us integrating this, we're going to have to square out and simplify. So let's multiply this out. Multiplying out, we're here. Notice that our inner and outer terms are each equal to a negative 1. So that gives us e to the 2t minus 2 plus e to the negative 2t when we multiply this out. And of course here we just have plus 4. Now combining the plus 4 and the negative 2 gives us a positive 2. And we compare what we have here to what we had here. Notice the only difference is the sign of the middle term. So that gives us the idea that this can be factored similar to what we started with except with a plus in between. And of course you're welcome to write that out and multiply out and check. But we go from here to this factored form and now since e to the t plus e to the negative t is going to be a positive value, we can cancel the square root and the square, and so we're here. And now we can integrate. So we get e to the t, this becomes a minus e to the negative t. We plug in our bounds, subtract, and we're here. And so the arc length problems for parametric curves are very similar to the arc length problems that we've already seen in Lesson 20. Sometimes you're just asked to set up, and sometimes we ask you to complete the integration and find the length of the curve. And this concludes our lesson on calculus with parametric curves.